the Secanolia Security Show in proud partnership with Centenary Bank and MTN. Hey, happy new month. My name is Dr. Mitch and this is the Secanolia Security Show. On this week's show, well, it's a topic that people really don't want to talk about. The future, the uncertain future. So, what do you do? How do you secure it? How do you ensure that posterity asset security is well catered for, for the next generations, for your kids, for people afterwards? Well, we're going to be talking about that and more on this show. But then again, if you want more Bueno live from Kingdom Kampala, where our offices are, <laughs> I've got to tell you, we've got a deal for you. On the 20th of November, we've got what we call Anniversary Week. So, if you haven't bought your latest security products, Secanolia is going to be discounting them. All these awesome products. So, go talk to your friends, your families, get everybody excited. Come on down. It's going to be hot. On today's show, he's got close to a decade of legal experience. He's a lecturer at the Islamic University and he's a managing partner at Ballon Advocates. Jamil Mukama Sanyu. And together with him, she's a legal practitioner who focuses on corporate and commercial law. Harmony Chihembo. Now this is the kind of show, kids, when we tell you to go to school, this is what we're talking about. Two lawyers and one doctor on set. <laughs> I love this. Great too much to have knowledge. you guys. Yes, too much knowledge, I'm telling you. Huh? But speaking of knowledge, let's dive into the core issue. Posterity asset security. What does that mean? It's a mouthful. Uh, posterity asset security is quite wide. Uh, but uh, simply it refers to uh, someone securing their assets yes. uh, for future generations. Okay. Uh, I you mean for your for your kids, for your, uh, your, your, your dependents, dependents yeah. any of your beneficiaries, okay. because we come from extended families, so yes. uh, it, it, it's a question of fact on who depends on you. And one of them could be through making a will. Okay. Uh, the next one could be through insuring your property. Yeah. And the other one, and the alternative, could be maybe putting your property under trust. But, but wait, 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 wait. I can't look at this thing called a will. The moment people hear about it, boop, hey! People switch off, people scatter, say, no, that. let's not discuss that. It's, it's, it's like it's taboo. Hmm? Why, why is that? Huh? But a will is a simple document. Yes. Uh, it is just uh, a, a document whereby someone expresses the manner uh, through which they want their property to be distributed upon their demise. So, so, so why should I, should I write one? It's incumbent upon everyone who owns property that they will write a will. Do I have to have buildings and the rest? Is it a certain amount or, or any asset in your life at all? Any, any, any form of asset. Why? Because a will saves us from the uncertainty mm. that comes around when the Lord calls upon you. Yeah. You know, whenever people die and they haven't stipulated the money in which their property is supposed to be distributed, our families break up. Yes. Uh, uh, relatives start bickering. There is yes. bad blood that starts breeding. Yes. Because everyone wants to take this, everyone wants to take that. Mm. However, when you stipulate the money in which you want your property to be distributed one it creates certainty yes uh, for your family for your children for your relatives and whichever dependent dependent you have i wanted to ask a question and and i, I think maybe how many how many you, you, you can help me out with this a lot of time people think okay let me wait till i'm 50 60 or 70 to write a will when is the the ideal time for me to write one you don't want the lord to call you when you're unprepared that's correct so the best time to write a will is as soon as possible today today as long as you have assets and property okay you should write okay. a will I'm put you guys on the spot yeah. you have a will i definitely have a will okay and I'm you have a, a i'm still property. acquiring property <laughs> <laughs> okay but then but, i can but, make a will but, but, so, so who can who can who can write a will? When you look at uh, the position of the law, yes, under the Succession Act, uh, it's not that everyone can do it, can write a will. Is that so? Yeah, true. Uh huh. Uh, in order to write a will, you must be at least of sound mind, and then secondly, you, you should be at least of majority age. Okay. Uh, the law that governs succession talks about 21 years of age. Yeah, uh, the law is also flexible and yeah. it enables people that are deaf, blind, are uh, dumb to yeah. also write wills as long as they understand what they're doing okay and then also people that are ordinarily insane 
in intervals when they are lucid and can understand what they're doing, yes. then they can also ably write a valid will. One of the parameters that guide whether a will is authentic or not, it, it, there should not be any form of coercion. You should understand the nature of document you're putting down. So I can't, I can't put you to task and say, here, write your will right now. Uh, no, no, it, it will definitely be vitiated. It can be challenged. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It, it won't be, be valid. Easily, yeah. what, what about this? I've, I've seen it happen quite a number of times, and people these days do visual wills, whereby they'll take a video and say, um, hi, my, my name is X, and I'd like to, to gift this to this person, etc., etc. Does Is that valid? Uh, essentially... Uh, it must be in writing. Uh, wills are classified into two categories. They're what they call unprivileged wills yeah. and privileged wills. For an unprivileged will, it at least must be in writing. Yeah. It must have property. Yeah. Because you can't say I'm distributing something which you don't own. You must yeah. at least first own property. Uh, uh, then it must have beneficiaries to whom this property is going to. Okay. Uh, then I, at the same time, uh, it must be made in a voluntary manner. As we said earlier on, there should, may, there should not be any form of coercion, duress, or, or undue influence, or any kind of force. Yeah. Uh, then the other form of wills is what they call the privileged wills. These ones uh, don't uh, follow the hard and fast rules of uh, the unprivileged wills, that it must be like this and this. These are privileged in, the, in a way that they are made by people in, on the front line. People like in active, war. People yeah. in active war, military yeah. service. Yeah. So, for example, if someone is in Garamba fighting mm. and they know any time they could die, yeah. they could make a will in that instant okay. without uh, following the classifications that it must be in writing. And this uh, kind of protection and privilege extends even to the nurses, to the cooks, and any of the other workers who are on active, uh, mil in active military service. Mm. But for a video recording alone, uh, unfortunately, under our laws, you'll have a challenge. Yeah, because I will at least must have a witness, must have two witnesses attestating purposes of authenticating whether it was truly made or not. Yes. So in the video, some of those things could be heard. So, so how many? Somebody has written their will. They did it probably when they're 21. And then God blesses you over the next 5, 10, 15 years. You acquire a lot of assets and, and the rest. Can you change your will? Hmm? Or... Is what you wrote 20 years ago going to stick and it doesn't capture the rest? No, no, no. You're not bound by what you wrote 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. You can actually change your will. It's flexible in the sense that as, as, as long as you're still alive, yeah. you can actually alter it, change it to your preference. Yeah. The good thing about it is that the will only becomes effective upon your death. So anytime before that, you can change it. All you need to do is execute a document, it's called a codicil. Yes. Yeah, and when, once you execute the codicil, then you can amend, alter, or modify the will in whichever way you want. Okay. So, so it's nice to know that your future is secure, the, the well-being of your dependents and your family is, is secure with a will. But in the instance that you don't have a will, what happens then? So when a person dies or God calls you before your time and you haven't put a will in place, then it means that you've died in tested. You do not leave a valid, a valid will in place. So okay. what happens is that the family comes together and they appoint sort of a representative for, for the whole entire family. Okay. And that representative then gets a chance to go and apply for letters of administration. Okay. These letters enable you to have the authority and the management of the estate of the person that has died. And under the law, it provides for different ways in which once you've acquired that management, you get to distribute it uh, among the heirs, the spouses, the dependent relatives. But the, but the, the, the administrator now yes. works independently or works in, in collaboration with the family? Yeah. He, he holds this property for the benefit of the family. It's not, okay. it's not so his or property. Yeah. Okay. So I think grammatically we will say in collaboration. In collaboration. Yeah. Okay, great. While you were speaking, you mentioned two other aspects of posterity asset security, you know, um, structuring. One was the will, which we've, we've delved into. What is a trust and how does it work so what happens with the trust that there's an arrangement between the person making the trust mm -hmm. puts their property in management for beneficiaries okay. so there's a person making the trust who's the settler 
and then they put this property in management to a trustee who holds it for the benefit of their children, relatives and so on. Yes. So that's basically how it works. So this is only for the next generation or it can be for perpetual generation? Because I've seen instances like, you, you have the stories of the Rockefeller Foundation, whichever trust, whatever. They have got generation upon generation of people managing. So how does that work? I think it's a question of fact. It, it depends on how you want it to operate. You can determine. Yes. The law gives you the freedom to decide. So if you want a specific generation, you can specify. If you want to, it to continue in perpetuity, yes. you can as well. Forever. Yeah, forever and ever. But all that depends on the... On, on whether you have the assets to sustain and yes. the management of the trust. Because we've had very many cases, let's say, in outside jurisdictions whereby trust collapse yes. because of the lack of, uh, of, of, of goodwill of the guys who manage the what? These trusts. Right. Yeah. So, so and, and what's the story here that everybody's been talking about insurance? Hmm? As a person, if you own property and you want to secure your assets for the future generations, you can decide to insure. There are different forms of insurance. There's life insurance, there's health insurance, and property insurance. So one of the ways through you can create financial certainty and financial security for your future generations and the generations yet to come after you mm -hmm. is by vying for insurance. Yeah. You only need to find a, a good insurance provider. To underwrite and to cover your property. Yeah. A policy that's suited for what you want. You know, because insurance is built on uncertainties. We don't know what's likely to happen tomorrow, yeah. what's likely to happen the other day. Right. So since this word also actually runs on uncertainties, in order to be able to fortify the interests of the people who depend on your existence, it's yes. better you opt for insurance Correct. where possible. All right. Well, there you've heard it from two of the, the best legal practitioners in the business, straight from Ballon Advocates. They've been talking about posterity asset security. How important is faith when securing your fortune? We have words of inspiration from Dunstan Kisule, CEO and founder of why save an asset is something that you have that generates money that you are able to receive so as a business you have to sit down and sit and make sure that the business that you've started outlives you and that is something that we are being very definite about as an organization to be able to do that's very, very important if you want to have posterity, you know, continuity, that you must bring in people, mentor them, allow them to do the work. They will make mistakes, but you must be around to correct them as they are doing the mistakes because nobody is going to live forever. So as a business, we are very deliberate as far as that is concerned. And for us, the other thing that we've done as a business is to have what we call the leadership development plan. We've laid out, we have our curriculum, where we develop our leaders, we also develop other people. So that, what are we trying to do? Is to pass on the skills that we have had to other people. If God was to bless you with a certain amount of money, inheritance, you've hit a jackpot. There are five things that I would advise you to do. Number one, tithe. Number two, before you do anything, sit down and find out what would you want to do with the money that you have received? That means you are going to do research about the different things that you want to do. The money would rather remain on the account even if it spends one or two years, but sit down, never start doing anything without doing any research. Number three, as you are carrying out your research, seek for advice. And number four, Never be tempted to do something which you are not familiar with. When you suddenly get your NSSF, you get your provident fund, you get this jackpot, that's when all these seemingly good opportunities come up. And number five, please avoid them. Avoid those investments that are promising you heaven on earth. Go back to number two and number three. So how important is business continuity? We sat down with Patrick Bitature, renowned businessman, and these are his insights. Now, typically, one generation builds a business, the next one destroys it. That's been the story in Africa. But also, we've not been in business for that long. Think about it. Africans were not allowed to do business in Uganda in the 1900s. It was a preserve of the Asian community. So until there were some demonstrations, and then when we got independence, there were still a handful of African businessmen. 
I remember my father in 1972, 73, going into business fully. And he was one of the few successful business people. And he was trading basic things from commodities, moving commodities, sugar, rice, uh, uh, products up country, bringing cattle to Kampala. Things that they were doing were very mundane the way I see it. And we only brought, started breaking that barrier in 1980s. The Chikubu hub has done well. Largely, they were not very well educated, but they have had some discipline and they've built a business culture amongst them. So I must give them respect or kudos for, for what they have done. Now, the challenge is, how do we have intergenerational businesses like the Madivanis, like the Mokwanos? It's not easy for us to do. And that's the task we've got to do. And at times, we'll send our children to the best schools all over the world, bring them back, and then they are not interested in the business. They are not interested in looking after your cattle and the businesses you are doing. So what do we do? Then we've got to look at Plan B. Plan B is having proper governance, structures, professional people to run the businesses. Your children remain shareholders, and you have a structure that will hold in trust their interest, and will probably, will probably list the company so that even other people are involved, so that there is continuity of these businesses. But holding together family-owned businesses is not an easy thing. And there are so many um, group discussions today and studies going on about family-owned businesses in Africa and how can we make them succeed? How can we make them intergenerational? What checks and measures must we put in place so that they do not collapse when the founder collapses? It's the Sekanyolia Security Challenge. Today's contestants, Edna, a businesswoman, versus Charlotte, a teacher. Who's gonna be coming out on top? So, is it gonna be Team Charlotte or is it gonna be Team Edna? One of the two is walking away victorious. Starting now. Mm-hmm. Tell me, Charlotte. 50. You should have your will at 50. That is incorrect. I'm giving you a chance to take the money. Do you want this chance? Yes. What age should I write a will? At C, as long as I have an asset. That is correct. I'm giving you one point, Edna. Next question. Mm-hmm. What is that, Edna? That is uh, a scanner. <laughs> That actually is a scanner. You're correct. One is a handheld scanner, the other one is a walkthrough scanner. So I give you the point. Two points. Next question. Edna, hey, hey, guy, your fingers are itchy. Uh huh. How many numbers does a Senti mobile pin have? It has four. Four is correct. You got three points. Aish, pressure. Accelerate. Next one. Uh huh. Tell me. What's that, Charlotte? Electric fencing. That is not electric fencing. You are correctly wrong. So, do you want to take the chance? Let me try. Go ahead. It's a laser. <laughs> laser what? Let me call it a laser fence. Laser fence. <laughs> laser fence. All right, yes, that is called razor wire fence. Next question. Edna? Ayoba. Ayoba is correct. You got five points. Aish. Okay. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, you know what we're going to do now? A lot of you must be thinking, oh, maybe this one doesn't work. We're going to swap the places. So, you try this one, you try this one here, and we see what to do. We've swapped the places to make sure that it's free and fair. In the lead, we've got Edna with five points. And Charlotte still yet to score a single point, but she can catch up. And then we go into sudden death. Next question. Good. Mm -hmm. Answer. None of the above. Edna, what do you think it is? A. MTN Mobile Money? That is the correct answer. You, that gives you six points. Final question. Charlotte. Yes. You've said, what is your answer? Give me a, a final answer. A. A is your final answer. I am very proud to tell you that that is the correct answer. Let's give her a big round of applause and congratulations to the lady all the way from Imperirue. Let's give it up to Edna, the businesswoman who's walked away with 200,000 shillings and goodies from MTN. And that's how the cookie crumbles on the quiz competition. Guess what? 
If you guys think that you got what it takes to be on the show, check out our social media handles and come on up and show us that you can kumalako. It could be you or you on this stage next week. We'd like to say a very special thank you to Centenary Bank for making it possible. A special thank you to MTN Uganda for staying as a true partner to the Second Yolia Security Show. A special thank you to Kingdom Kampala. And we'd like to say thank you to Techno. And of course, a very special thank you to Ballon Advocates for coming in today and sharing a lot of insights. My name is Dr. Ronnie Miche Guang, and guess what? Security is for everyone.